Turn in your Bibles tonight to Matthew chapter 5. And I want to read for the text verses 3 through verse 12. Are you thinking about tomorrow? Are you worried about tomorrow? In Matthew 6, 34, Jesus said, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So the Lord was teaching us there to turn things over to God. Let Him take care of tomorrow. We need to be watching uh, for temptation, to live close to Him, to live as He wants us to live and devote our time and attention today. I don't think that means that we can't make some plans as long as we put the Lord first. But we're not, to, we're not to fret and to worry about tomorrow, but to trust God for the things that we need. All right, Matthew chapter 5. I want to read verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Excuse me, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Father, we come to you tonight and Lord, we, we praise thee, we glorify thee. And we need Thee. And we realize, Father, that we need Thee so much every day, every hour of the day. And Lord, we look to Thee for our strength and for our help. And we pray that You will just guide us. We pray that You'll guide us through this week. Every day that You'll be close to us. And Lord, that You'll bless us and help us to do Your will. Now help us that we can be witnesses for you as we go through life, that we can let Jesus shine through our life and cause other people to want to be saved and cause other people to get saved. Now be with us tonight, we pray, and bless this service. Just help it to be what thou dost want it to be. Pour out thy Holy Spirit upon thy people, and we'll praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach on the subject, Saved and Happy, one of the most respected groups of our military is the Navy SEALs. To be a Navy SEAL, a person must be willing to make a commitment. And it must be something that they want to do with all their heart. Because a half-hearted person will not become a Navy SEAL. It takes about a year of intense training to go through the process of becoming a Navy SEAL. Only about 20% of those who apply will finish the course. Only about 20% who really want to become a Navy SEAL will become a Navy SEAL. And that's just the training. Once a person has been trained and graduated from school and has become a Navy SEAL, there is the process of the job for they are called upon many times to, to, to do jobs that no one else can do. That no one else can even think about doing. And so they have to have a complete dedication. To be a Navy SEAL requires total commitment. Jesus talked about total commitment. And he gave the Beatitudes. He gave eight characteristics of a person who is happy. He used the word blessed to describe believers who live for Christ. That is people who really want to live for Jesus. People who, have sur who surrender their whole heart and their mind and their soul because they believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and they want to follow him. 
The word blessed means someone who is precious in God's eyes. Precious in God's heart. Someone the Lord blesses or makes happy. That's what the word blesses mean, means. It seems to me that if a person wants to be happy, truly happy, not just have pleasure, but to be truly happy, to follow the prescription and the formula that Jesus gives here in the Beatitudes is the way to happiness. And so I want to preach tonight on the subject saved and happy. You know, there's some people who are saved who are not happy. There's some people at least who profess the name of Jesus Christ who, who are not happy. They don't, have, they don't have the joy of the Lord in their heart. The Lord, want, he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly, he said. And so to, to, when, we, when we know, this word believe means all out commitment. And so when we come to Christ, it means that we give our whole life and our whole heart and our whole soul to him. First of all, Jesus taught that a person who's humble is a happy person. Let me take you to Matthew, the 18th chapter, and read the first four verses there. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little child, excuse me, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told his disciples here that to follow him, a person had to become like a little child. The disciples were evidently here in Matthew 18, they were discussing who was the greatest. There was a discussion going on here, and I, we're, not, we're not given exactly what they said. We don't know what criteria they were using to say that, that I'm, I'm maybe a little bit stronger in the faith than you are. Maybe God has given me a little bit more of a gift or of a talent than, than you have. But at least we know that they were discussing who was the greatest in, in the kingdom of heaven. Churches do that today. You know, there's, 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 always this, there's always this tendency, it seems like, among churches to, to try to, to assert ourselves and say that we're better than another. Let me tell you, really in God's eyes, churches, uh, churches ought to not be competing with each other. Listen, we're trying, to, we're trying to win the world, amen? We're trying to win souls. That's why it's so important whenever we talk to people and we go out on visitation that we're not trying to take people out of other churches. We want to reach people who are lost, people who are backslidden, people who are lukewarm. We want people to get saved. And we want them to come into the kingdom of God. We're really not in competition with other churches. It's so important. Listen, the disciples were competing with each other. And Jesus taught them that that was not good. You know, it keep, and it kept popping up. I won't take you there tonight, but over in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses 22 through 28, uh, the, the scripture says, The mother of Zebedee's children came to him and desired that one would sit on his right hand and the other would sit on his left hand. Well, she was trying to, she was trying, and they were evidently were, they were, evidently were accomplices in this. She was trying to, pl to find a place for, for her sons that would give them a little bit of a more of a uh, of prestige in the kingdom of heaven than the other the other 12 the other 10 apostles would have and and when the other 10 found out about it they didn't like it they were they were concerned about what she was trying to you know we have that tendency don't we every one of us has pride pride is something god wants us to get rid of Pride is something God wants us to realize that, that will hinder us from serving. I've seen people not get saved because of pride. I've seen people cause problems in churches because of pride. I've seen people cause problems in marriage and problems in, and, and probably all of us have had our round with pride. But God wants us to lose our pride to surrender to him and be humble before him and live as he wants us to live. Jesus gave a lesson on humility and service. He said, if I can put it in my own words, be like me. Follow me. Jesus came into the world. Jesus didn't just come into the world to die on the cross. How important that is. 
That, he, that we be forgiven of our sins and, and, and we be saved and we, be, and we follow him and live for Christ and go to heaven. How important it is. But you see, Jesus came into the world to live a perfect life, to show us how to live. A lot of people don't know how to live. That's what the Bible is for, amen? That's why we study the Bible, because we don't know. We need to understand, folks. So many people are so proud. They think, I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I know how to live. No, people don't. We need to study the Bible to find out how God wants us to live. And then we can have victory. When we begin to surrender to the Lord, to be a disciple of Jesus, a person must be converted Jesus used this word converted, and it means to, to, to totally change. You know, uh, we know about the conversion of, of AC current in electricity to DC current, that is alternating current. That is current that alternates back and forth to direct current or vice versa. But when you change electrical current, when you change it, you know that there's a change there. It's, a, it's altogether different than it was. There's been, a, there's been a change there. Listen, when people, when people are converted, there is a change. God has wrought a mighty change in their life. We understand that in every other area. I, uh, I, knew, I, I knew of a person one time, knew about a person. He was not, I was not really acquainted with him, but I, I was acquainted enough I knew his manner of life. And he stuttered. Stuttered real bad. And he went to one of these healing meetings, and he said, I've been healed. I don't stutter anymore. But he did. You know, he, he did a little better for two or three days, it seemed like, but he stuttered, he stuttered just as bad after, after he claimed to be healed than he was, than he did. Be. Well, he wasn't healed. That's not hard. We understand that in every area of life. We understand that when, whenever you say you've been healed, there's a change there. If you say, you, if, you know, the, the man that, that Jesus healed of, of blindness, if he went around groping around, he said, I, I can see. That wouldn't have helped anything, but he could see he had been changed. When a person's converted, there's a total change in their life. Pre preacher, you say, how can I? You know when you've been changed, amen? You know what God's done in your life. People who profess to be Christians have been converted by the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. They're different than they were before. And, and, and they know whether they've been changed or not. Listen, folks, we know whether we've been saved or not. Jesus said to be a disciple, a person must be as a little child. We've got to get rid of our pride. I've seen people who wouldn't come to the altar because they didn't want to walk up in front of a church full of people. That's pride. You know, in order to get saved, we have to be willing to, we have to be willing to own Jesus Christ public, publicly. We have to be willing to, under, to own up and say, I'm a sinner, I've blown it. And only God can save me. Are you saved tonight? Have you lost your pride? Have you given it to God? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Jesus taught that to be a disciple, a person must be humble. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. A person who is humble is blessed of the Lord and is a happy person. Yeah, that's probably one aspect of humility we don't think about because when we get rid of the pride, it gives us happiness. God gives us happiness. The Lord blesses our life. Whenever we, you see, when we're right with the Lord and we're surrendering our life, and, you know, and pride is a big part of that because it's pride a lot of times. It's pride in Christians' lives, in our own lives many times. It's our own self-pride that keeps us from getting right with God. And that makes us unhappy. You see, when we, when we totally give up to God, when we totally surrender to the Lord, that's when we find real happiness because the Holy Spirit can work in our heart. You know, are you happy tonight? Oh, you say, preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. I know you're God. Amen? Amen? God's bigger than your problem. God's bigger than your need. 
And part of pride is that we can't give up to him. We have to say, I've got to hang on. I've got to do this myself. God, I can't let God do it for me. But when we, when we humble ourselves before the Lord and we turn it over to our God because he's big enough, he's powerful enough, he's strong enough, and we trust him and we give up our pride, he can give us happiness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. An humble Christian is a happy Christian. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians verse, chapter 4. And let me read there 6 and 7. There's a real neat truth there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It's amazing how you can read over Scripture for years. I don't know how many times I've read the book of 1 Corinthians. I don't know how many times I've read this book, and I've taught this very concept in church many times. And some of you will recognize the concept because you've sat in my classes and you've heard me teach this concept until I read over this, this couple of verses and I said, huh, that's what that says. That's why it's important to read the Bible. Amen. Let me go here to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6 and 7. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? That's powerful stuff. Think about the last part of, that, of verse 7 there. I want to read that for you again. Let me read verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? Who is it that makes you different from someone else? Isn't it God? It's not you. It's not me. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Do we have something we didn't receive of the Lord? A man has a good job. God gave it to him. Amen. Amen. Everything we have came from God. Every good thing can, comes from God. Notice what he says. What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now the, the last part is, now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Why do you have pride? That's what he's saying. Why do you glory in yourself? Well, I'm prettier than she is. Where'd you get your looks? Did you... Did you you didn't get them out of a beauty parlor, I'll tell you that. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than he is. I, 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 can, I can do math better than he does. H.A. Ironside wrote commentaries on the Bible, a preacher. And, he, and I, I read one time that he had a photographic memory. Boy, that would, I would... <laughs> I would love to have a photographic memory. You know what that means? You can read something and remember it. Instead of like I am, have to read something three or four times, you can read it one time and remember it. A lot of Bible verses and things that he read just were there in his mind. He didn't even have to memorize them. He would just read them. And then when he needed to quote them chapter and verse, he could quote them chapter and verse. My goodness, what an intelligent person. But according to what the Apostle Paul said, it was God who gave him a photographic memory. He couldn't glory in that. He couldn't glory and say, I can get up and I can remember whole pages of the Bible. I can remember what I read yesterday in, in magazines and things like that. And I'm a greater preacher than this person. No, it was God who made him what he was. And it's God who makes us what we are. Every good thing. Now, God doesn't do the evil things. We do that. Amen? Amen. The devil does that. See, we don't have any right to pride. Seems to me a person is happy who knows they're no better than the least of God's people. You see, when we come to the place that we understand life is about God, then we can begin to find the happiness the Lord wants us to have. And that means humbling ourselves before. That means, if, you know, if God taps us on the shoulder and the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and says there's sin in your life. Go and get it taken care of. It's pride that keeps us from doing that. It's humility that allows us 
to say, I don't care what people think. I care what God thinks. You see, we need to turn our life completely. That's what Jesus was talking about here. We need to turn our life completely over to the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. People are humble. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, Jesus taught that a person who sacrifices for his sake is a happy person. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. Let me read there verses 27 through 30. Jesus had another lesson. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I believe that will be in eternity. Some people put it in the millennial. I put it in eternity. I always have to be different. But I believe that will be the reward of the 12 apostles that they, they, will set upon, they will set upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in eternity. But notice the next verse. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus taught a valuable lesson about happiness. All the things we think make us happy don't make us happy in this world. They give us pleasure. They may give us a lot of pleasure. But they're not really the things that make us happy. You see, if we can get this in our heart and in our mind, if we can understand this concept that it is God and God alone who makes us happy. It is not the things or the people or whatever this world has to, whatever this world has to offer. Nothing in this world, absolutely 100%, nothing in this world can give you happiness tonight. Only God can do that. Houses. They won't make you happy. Give you some pleasure. Even family. And the Lord wants us to love our, you know, the Lord wants us to love husbands to love their wives, wives to love their husbands, children, families to love their children. But you see, it's only when a family surrenders, that whole family, it's only when the family surrenders their heart to God and serves the Lord, they can have real happiness. Otherwise, there's going to be a tug of war in that family. In other words, there's going to be problems in that family. Possessions, money, those are not things that make us happy. I enjoy having money. I enjoy being able to kind of do a few things along, but that's not what makes you happy. If, you're, if your happiness is in money, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Amen? Notice what Jesus said and in verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Missionaries have to forsake those things. They have to go into foreign lands. Give up the nice and the comfortable things of life. And go to a place that a lot of times people don't understand. The, they don't understand the language and go to a place where they have to sacrifice and, 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 and give up the comforts that they have at home. They have to give up. The, their, even a lot of times they go and have to give up their, their families because they know they're not going to see their families for a long time. Maybe not ever again until they get to heaven. Why do they do that? Because they know that God 
has a purpose for them. See, we're here to do God's will. Everybody say amen. That's my purpose tonight, just to do God's will. That's your purpose tonight. I've seen preachers have to give up houses and families to go do God's will. Christians make sacrifices because they, they love the Lord. Worldly things give us pleasure, but they don't give us happiness. Jesus taught that to be poor for his sake is to find happiness. I want you to hear this. So many people today, this country today is so, is so into, into mammon and material things. People are so in the flesh. My goodness, look around. Don't you get tired of it? Don't you get tired of, 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 of advertising and don't you get tired of, of all the things that we see today? Don't you get tired of the world flaunting the flesh before you? Because they are convinced that's what makes people happy. But it's not. I guarantee you Arnold Schwarzenegger is not happy tonight. Jesus th taught to be poor, that is to give up, to understand this principle. He's not saying just go in and give things away and get rid of your stuff. But understand this principle, that if you, what you give up for him, that's what makes you happy. Over in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 20, Jesus said this beatitude a little different. He said, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed be you poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. What he was talking about is people who give up worldly things and worldly possessions and, and all these worldly things. Though people who give those things up for him, God will bless them. He will, he will help them to be happy. I've never had anything in my life that God was not pleased with that didn't give me trouble. We hold on to it, don't we? Because we want to do it. We can't let God do it. We have to hold on to it. We think God's not able to handle it. But when we find out that, yes, okay, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, and I will give it up if you want me to, and we give it up and God begins to bless us, then we find happiness. It's not easy. Let me ask you this. What if a young person would totally live his life or her life for Jesus Christ. Young people, let me, let me point this at you. Let me, let me ask you this question. What would happen if your life, to your life if you would totally surrender to Jesus Christ, give up everything for Christ, and decide that I am going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to do the Lord's purpose. I'm going to go where the Lord wants me and do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm going to, if whatever the Lord asks me to give up, I'm going to give it up. What would happen to your life if you would really do that? You see, that's what Jesus Christ did. He lived his whole life for his Father. Never draw attention to himself. He always pointed people to the Father. Did you ever notice that? The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. Jesus pointed people to the Father. And everywhere he went and everything he did, he did to please his heavenly Father. What victories. What victories. God could work in our life if we turn it over to him. We can't do that though, can we? We can't afford to tithe because God can't take care of us. I, I, I can't afford, I got too many bills, I got too many things happening, I can't afford, I've had people say that, I can't afford to tithe. My friend, how can you afford not to? Why, preacher? You're asking me, you're asking me to do the impossible. Listen, Jesus doesn't ask you to do it on your own. He asks you to do it with his power and with his help. God is able to handle the situation. I 
I can look back on my life. From the time I answered the call to preach, my life changed. I fought it for six years. I was holding on to the world. My biggest regret, you've heard me say this many times and probably I will say it again, one of my, at least one of my biggest regrets in life is I didn't answer the call to preach six years earlier. Think of all those years I fought the call to preach. I was holding on to the world. I wanted to do it my way. I couldn't let God do it His way. When I come to the place I can't preach, Lord, just take me home. Amen? Unless you got something else for me to do, Lord. You got to trust Him even than that. Happiness, here's what it is. Let's put it in our hands. Let's, let's take hold of it. Let's handle it so we can see what it is. Let's, let's examine it. Let's understand in our life the things that are making us unhappy. Happiness is loving the Lord. Anything that detracts from our, from our dedication, our surrender, our love for Christ, anything that causes, that pulls us away from the Lord is causing us unhappiness. It may be fun, it may be pleasure, but it's going to come down around our ears. Jesus said that, Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. He said, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to know what the Bible is about? It's not hard to understand. I read down to the King James 16:11, and I, I probably think every one of you understood. It's God first, Amen, and people second, and us last. Give ourselves to the Lord. Love the Lord. Put it in your hand right there. The things, the thing that's going to make me happy is loving the Lord, and anything that keeps me from loving the Lord is going to make me unhappy. That's not easy to love the Lord. See, that's a mistake a lot of people make. They think, okay, I'm willing to do that if God will make it easy. God's not going to make it easy. Love's not easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus to die on the cross, but that was love. And if we love the Lord with all of our heart and our mind and our soul, we'll have to work at it. It'll come by inches. It'll come by degrees as we learn to trust God. Jesus taught that if we would sacrifice for Him, we would be happy. Listen to what He said in Luke 6.20, And He lifted up His eyes on His disciples and said, Blessed are ye poor. He didn't say, Blessed are ye rich. He said, Blessed are ye poor. And he's talking about people who are poor for his sake. Not just because not just because they're poor. Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Christians who are unhappy have never become, have never become disciples. Because a disciple, the, the twelve apostles discounting Judas who fell, the 12 apostles followed Jesus. And they had to give up everything to follow him. They had to drop their nets. When he called them, he, they had to answer. They had to drop their nets right then. They had to give their whole lives to serving the Lord. It cost them everything they had, even in some of them their lives to serve him. Most of them. But we want a cheap salvation. We want, as Bonhoeffer called it, I think it was Bonhoeffer said it was cheap grace. Christians who are unhappy or have never become 
disciples. They hang on the pleasure and security of the world. How much do you sacrifice for the Lord tonight? Are we disciples enough to give up our time for the Lord? Or we say, no, Lord, that's mine. You can't have my time. That belongs, to, that belongs to my employer. That belongs to my family. That belongs to me. I've, I've met so many people. I've asked them to come to church. And they say, well, you know, I'd really like to. Yeah, I, I, was, I was saved back there. I, I gave my heart to the Lord back there. I would really like to come to the church. But you know, Sunday morning is the only time I have to sleep. My employer deserves my time, but God doesn't. You say, preacher, you're being awfully hard on people. No, I'm talking about happiness and joy. And, the, and, it's, and it's loving God that makes us happy. It's not the job that makes us happy. I want people to make a living. I don't want to put a heavy burden upon people. But you see, we have to put God first in our life. And in America, we've, to a large degree, we've forgotten how to do that. Let me tell you something. Sunday is the Lord's day. Everybody say that with me. Sunday is the Lord's day. It belongs to God. Now it's for man. It's for our rest. It's for us to worship the Lord. It's for us to be spiritual and, and, and have one day. I've heard people say, well, you know, I don't just keep Sunday because, you know, I keep every day of the week trying to put people who believe Sunday is a sacred day, trying to put them in a bad position. Well, let me tell you, keep every day of the week and keep Sunday. That's what pleases God. And what they're really saying is I don't want to give up my day. It's my day. It's not the Lord's day. Well, I could go on. Witnessing. Preach about that all the time. Because it's so vital in the day in which we live. Telling people about Jesus in a good way, in a nice way, in a loving way, in a caring way. Introducing people to Jesus Christ. But you see, when we're worried about the things of the world, I don't care what it is. People use their family as an excuse. God wants us to love our family. I want you to love your This church teaches loving your family. Sacrificing for your family. Men loving their wives. Wives loving their husbands. Parents loving their children. Children loving their parents. That's what, God's, that's what pleases God. But we must put Him first. Amen? Or our family becomes idols. What is it that's making you unhappy tonight? Let me tell you what's making you unhappy tonight. You're holding on to something you haven't turned over to God. I've gone through that. I fail at that. I'm growing in that. See, let me ask you, is it something you want in this world? We get so involved in things, don't we? We want this and we want that. We want this and we work at this and we work at it and we, to get this. And that's the thing that's going to make us the most unhappy. Because it's not what God wants. Is it some pleasure you seek in this world? Make you unhappy. I knew a, a man one time. His name was Ed. God called him to preach. And he wanted to preach so bad. His wife told him, if you preach, I'm leaving. I will not be a preacher's wife. Now that is a predicament. He was so unhappy the wonderful, beautiful lady he'd given his life for and, and married, the wonderful, beautiful lady he loved so much became the source of his unhappiness. 
You see, let's handle it a little bit. Loving God, giving our life to God, sacrificing our life to Christ. That's what makes us happy. Happiness comes from doing God's will, laying ourselves aside. I read a story the other day about a Christian who was such a testimony for Christ. He was, he was a common laborer. And one day his boss came to him and his boss said, you know, I've watched your life. And he said, you're so, you're so happy. He said, you're, you're just always, you're always, you've always just bubbling over with happiness. He said, I don't know what you got, but I want it. Whatever it is, I want it. He knew it was Jesus. And what he was saying is, I want to, I want to be a Christian. I want Jesus. How can I have this? The laborer was pretty smart. He said, go home, put on your best clothes, best best suit of, of clothes and come back here and get down in this ditch and dig in this mud with us. And the boss said, what? I'm not going to do that. And this went on several times to shorten the story. This went on several times. The, the boss would come to him and say, look, I, I, I want what you got. He said, go home, put on your best, clo- co- best suit of clothes, come back, get down in this mud, roll up your sleeves and dig with us. I ain't going to do that. One day he came and he said, okay, I give up. I'll do it. And the laborer said, you don't have to. (laughs) He had to get rid of self, didn't he? Self had to get out of the way. What he wanted in this world had to get out of the way. Folks, let me tell you, if we're really going to get a hold of Jesus and let him have our life, we've got to get self out of the way. Happiness. Happiness. It's what the whole world is seeking after. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happiness comes from getting self out of the way and letting God in. The last thing, Jesus taught that a person who has the kingdom of heaven is happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People who are in the kingdom of heaven are happy people. But you know, we need the kingdom of heaven inside of us. Poor in spirit are those who know they need the Lord. People just today. There are, there are so many who are lost and out in sin. There always have been. There's only a few people, comparatively, there's only a few people who, can, who are going to go through that straight gate. And walk that narrow road. I didn't say that. Jesus did. The political correctness people can get all upset and mad and angry and all that they want to. But he's the boss. And Jesus said there are not going to be many who are saved. There are not going to be many comparatively who go to heaven. The Marines are looking for a few good men. Jesus is looking for people who will come to him and give him their heart, their mind, and their soul. There's true happiness in living in the kingdom of heaven. Joseph Hayden in the 1700s was a great composer. And when he was asked why his church music was always so cheerful, he said, I cannot make it otherwise. He had the Lord in his heart. He had the kingdom of heaven in his heart. That's where it has to be, folks. See, right now we're not, in, we're not in, the, in the sense that we're talking about living in heaven right now. But we can have heaven in our heart. We can have heaven in our soul. We can have Jesus in our heart. Do you have that? You have the glory of the Lord in your heart. The Bible tells us that soon, soon. You see, there's two parts to the King of heaven, as, at least as I see what the Bible teaches. First of all, we need to get saved, really saved, really become a disciple, not just a... I don't mean to belittle the word Christian, but it's used so haphazardly today. It's used in such a shallow sense today by so many people. Just like the term born again. Born again is a deep subject. But it's used and not understood what Jesus meant when he said you must be born again. Jesus never called Christians. Look at it. You'll find it. It didn't happen. He called disciples. 
Is your relationship deep enough with the Lord that you've invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart and you meant it with all your heart and you follow Him and you've given your life to Him and you have the kingdom of heaven in you? But there is coming a time when the Lord comes, when He takes His church to heaven with Him, there is coming a time that we're actually going to live. We're going to live in God's presence. We're going to live in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If I can put it in my own words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they are the ones that's going to live in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. R.A. Torrey was a great preacher. God blessed him, filled him with the Spirit of God, blessed him. He'd preach and, and people would come to the altar. Souls would get saved. Wouldn't you love to see that? He had great sadness in his heart that most people didn't know about. His daughter, 20 years old, was in an accident and died. When they buried her, Mrs. Tory, Sister Tory, stood at the gravesite and said, I'm so glad that Elizabeth is not in that box. I'm glad she's in heaven. Even though they knew she was in heaven, it was just all that they could take. They had to just turn it over to God. And I think all of us here parents understand that. Ari Torrey was walking down the street. I can't quote it exactly. I'll just give it in my own words. His heart was so broken, so sad over the loss of his daughter, and he began to pray to the Lord. And he said, torrents of the Holy Spirit came into his heart and just kept on and kept on and kept on. You see, he had the kingdom of heaven in his heart. And he knew by the grace of God, because his daughter was saved and because he and his wife were saved, he knew that one day he was going to live in the presence of Jesus Christ. He was going to live in the kingdom of heaven. And they, him and his wife and his daughter, was going to be reunited. It's hard to give everything to God. It's not easy. Jesus never said it was easy. But he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, because that which makes us happy is loving God. Loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. You do that. Let's pray.